This conference will now be recorded. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day, for the gift of being able to call you Father in the midst of the church, for the gift uh, of the Son who saved us, and the gift of the Holy Spirit who fills us with life. We ask, Father, in a particular way for the gift of patience, the grace uh, that we need to walk uh, in the spiritual journey. Grant us deep trust and confidence that if we're in desolation, it will soon, soon end and the consolation will return and fill us with the gifts of hope, trust, and joy. Mother Mary, we entrust this time, this night, uh, this day to you, all that we've accomplished, all that we failed to accomplish, our weaknesses and our strengths. May all be brought to the Father through your intercession as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Great. Well, it's great to be back with you guys uh, today to, to go through um, the eighth rule for the rules of discernment of spirits. And just the, the joy that I think that this, this rule is for, for so many of us and just the hope that it gives. So the eighth rule reads this, thus, let him who is in desolation labor to be in patience, which is contrary to the vexations which come to him. And let him think that he will soon be consoled, employing against the desolation, the devices, as is said in the sixth rule. So what Ignatius uh, basically is laying out for us is first and foremost, that there's two things. One, that we have, we, have, we have work to do. Like he's saying, listen, like you can't just sit there passively. You have to, you have to, to engage in this. There's, there's, a, there's a work that must be done. It's a spiritual work. Um, and, and that spiritual work, though, is not, not one that comes out of a place of self-reliance. It's not a work that comes out of the sense of, like, I have to pull up my bootstraps and get it done. But it's really a labor to remain in the spiritual disciplines that we have from Rule 5 and from Rule 6. Right? It's, it's, it's these spiritual, it's this labor to, to remain in the practices that that I have chose, that I chose to invest myself in during a time of spiritual consolation, as well as uh, the way that I've pushed against the desolation, right, with prayer and meditation, much examination uh, in my own life. So Ignatius is laying out for us in this eighth rule a further uh, important step, which is the maintaining of patience. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not a very patient person, right? I do not like red lights. I do not like traffic. I do not like being inconvenienced in, in any way. So if in my spiritual life, there's any inconvenience, I'm taken out of this place of consolation and brought into desolation, all I wanna do is fix it and get it back so I'm back in a place of consolation, right? And, and, the, Lord, the, Lord, and the Lord reveals to Ignatius that our lives are these are is this ebb and flow right it's this valley and this hill between desolation and consolation and we're alternating back and forth it's like a sine curve or a cosine curve whatever if you like mathematics it works with you but it, it, it's this oscillation it goes up and down up and down and there's times when we have what's called tranquility which uh we'll talk about it another time but ignatius really is clear that the human person is going to go through these periods of ups and downs and that the patience is, is to not let ourselves be disturbed by that, which is far easier said than done, right? Because patience is a practical virtue. It's a virtue that is only learned in, 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 in doing. So I remember one of, my, one of my directors said, you know, Stephen, you should, you should pray for patience. And I said, okay. So I said, all right, Lord, I, I'd like patience. Help me to grow in patience today. And I, I tell you, everywhere I drove that day, I got a red light. Everywhere I drove, I got a red light. And I thought to myself, Jesus, how am I growing in patience? I am ready to, to like, 
I'm ready to just, I don't know what I'm ready to do, but like there's all this anger, right? And frustration because in my pride, I should be somewhere and I should, you know, anyways, I should have accounted for whatever the shouldas are, but it's a practical virtue. We only grow in patience by recognizing in the moment that I don't, that, that, that the Lord is here in this moment, that I am not uh, responsible for making something happen. Um, that I am not responsible for, for making something uh, occur. Uh, that, that the patience is, is that I can walk and each red light, it's like, okay, Lord, you know what? You All things work for the good. So in this red light, in this moment, in the red light, you're, you're, you're working for the good. In this next red light that I just came to, you're, you're working for my good in some way. Just help me in this moment to surrender it to you, right? To, to let you be in charge of this moment. Desolation is the same. In spiritual desolation, it's, it's Lord, in this moment, you are still good, right? In the seventh rule, we're turning, we're considering again how the Lord permits this. So we're turning back to God and we're saying, Lord, you permit this. And because, Lord, you permit this, your, your hand is, is, is very much in it. So we're being asked by the Lord uh, through St. Ignatius, right, to say, okay, Lord, help me to be patient here. Help me to trust that your hand is in it. And I don't have to, to get worked up. I don't have to become anxious. I don't have to become overly concerned. But rather, I can endure this. I can push against the desolation with patience because I know that all things work for the good for him who trusts in God. And this is where the patience comes from, right? The patience comes because in the sixth rule, I've learned how to labor and to stand against desolation. I've learned how to push against it. In the seventh rule, I've recalled that the Lord is the one, like the Lord has given me the grace sufficient in this moment to stand against desolation. The Lord is the one who allows me to stand against it. So the eighth rule says, I can be patient. I don't have to get worked up. I don't have to let the enemy overwhelm me. Now, I say that, right? But as you know, when you're stuck in traffic or when you get a red light and you, need to, and you think you need to be somewhere, how do you respond? Right? It's incredibly hard to be patient. So when you're in desolation, it's incredibly hard to be there. Because what the enemy whispers to you and to me in desolation is, it's never going to end. It's not going to stop. You know, why, why do you keep trying? You might as well give up, right? The enemy keeps whispering these things to us, and we have to be like, no, it's not, that's not of God. That's not of the Lord. And so the patience is hard because the enemy is constantly whispering against it, and the enemy is trying to make it seem like this is the way it's going to be forever. It's not going to change. And so Ignatius, in his wisdom, says, well, in order for us to really hold on to this patience, we have to consider, we have to think, and to believe that we will soon be consoled. We have to believe that consolation is coming again, that we're not going to be in this place of desolation forever, but that consolation is coming again. And in some ways, it might, in, in some ways, the Lord, it, it could already be here. It could just be around the next corner, around that next light. But we have to, we have to, to choose and to consider that the consolation is coming back. It's, it's not gone forever, that the Lord is, is going to bring it back. And, and what that does is it allows us the, the peace to know that just like a wave, it will pass. That just like a swell, the desolation, Will pass. I don't know if you've ever been on, on the ocean, right? And you don't have waves that break on the ocean because it's so deep. Instead, you have these swells and they just go up and down and up and down. And, and if you're in a really small boat, it's scary as all get up because sometimes you're in the trough and the swell is above you. Uh, and, and so in the, middle of, in the middle of a time of desolation, that's what it often feels like. You're in the, you're in, 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 in the valley and you're surrounded by these giant waves on either side, and you're afraid they're going to break over you. But when we consider that soon I'll be on the top, I'll be on the on riding the top of the swell, able to see across the horizon, able to see everything, right? That soon I'll be there. All of a sudden, it's like, okay, well, I, I'm I'm just going to ride this out, and we're going to be brought right back up top. 
And this is the beauty of what Ignatius is inviting us to, right? And, and this is really the, the simplicity of, of the eighth rule, that in a time of desolation, it's a time for patience. It's a time to take one step at a time, recognizing that in this moment, the Lord is giving me a particular gift to be able to unite everything to him, to, to, sh to share with him everything that's going on for the sake of the salvation of souls, my soul in particular, but also many others, as well as the maintaining of the gift of peace that comes from patient endurance. Now that doesn't mean that it's easy because we have to always reflect, we have to always consider, um, you know, we have to constantly be doing that meditation and examination to, to make sure that we are in that place that allows the Lord to move within us. Um, so just a, a couple of things, right, that we just want to hold up for this as well, that, that is so beautiful, right, is that, like, I just love the word labor, because that's what it is. Like, when you're in a time of desolation, it's, it's laborious. But when you're in a time, time of spiritual consolation, everything's great. Like, you would, you would, you would serve, you know, let's say you're a nurse or, or in the medical profession, right, and if, and if life is going really well, you know, you go see, you see your patients and you're like, this is wonderful. Like I get so much out of seeing my patients. These are so many gifts and so many blessings. But when life becomes challenging or difficult or like, and, 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 and dry, it's like no matter what we do, when we see the patient, we're almost resentful to see them. We're like, why you're, you're it's just like, I don't want to see you. I don't want to take care of you. I don't want to be here in this moment. And there can be this resentment and this frustration with them. We're like, Lord, which makes it hard. And so Ignatius would say that in these moments, right, in these moments, we want to share this with the Lord and take the opportunity to offer each patient or each occasion, offer that up for the sake of the salvation of that person, of our own salvation for the grace, right? Um, I just, I think of this principally because of everything that's going on and, and God bless all of our doctors, because I think that, that that can happen. I know it happens with priests. There are times in a priest's life when, when he's in a place of spiritual desolation that, that walking with people in the lives of their faith becomes incredibly challenging because of their own place and their own relationship with the Lord. They're like, I, everything feels like a burden. Everything feels, just feels um, just like it takes 10 times more energy that I just don't have. And all I can do in those moments is to say, Lord, help me just to do to meet with this one person. Lord, help me just to take this one step with this person. Lord, help me just, just to focus on this moment with, with what's going on right now. And, and there's a great beauty in that because it speaks to our powerlessness apart from God's grace. There's a great beauty in it because it speaks to our limitation and our weakness apart from God's grace. But it also speaks to, as we said in the seventh rule, that the Lord gives us the graces sufficient to be able to stand against it with our, with, and just with, um, just within our, our, the natural aptitudes. He gives us the necessary graces to be able to stand against the desolation. Uh, but, but the challenge, right, is to remain patient there and not to get, not to be, to get worked up, not to become agitated, not to, to begin to, um, uh, for for no for lack of a better way of saying it, freak out, right? I think sometimes when we experience desolation, we freak out because we're like, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. This isn't the way I want it to be. I must be doing something wrong. I need to fix this. And and I think that the freaking out is something that is um, is common for for a lot of people, uh, you know, myself included. When I find myself in desolation and I don't realize I'm in desolation. I start going through a litany of potentials of possibilities of things that could be that I could have done wrong or could be doing wrong. And that stirs up anxiety, that stirs up fear, that stirs up all sorts of things. When the Lord's just and the Lord's simply saying, uh, just just to me here, right? The Lord's simply saying to us here, right? No, this is this is just it's a natural part of the spiritual life. And because it's natural, it means we also have the graces that can that and transform it into a great gift and a great blessing. So just a few other little, little things that we just want to hold up here, right? Is that 
this patience that we're being invited to consider, right? This, this patience, uh, which is really the key virtue in times of spiritual desolation, right? First with myself, because in times of desolation, it's, a, it's much harder to choose to, choose to do uh, what the Lord has invited me to do, especially in the beginning. Your first time, my first th time through desolation, I'm like, I'm done. I don't, I don't want to keep walking in the life of faith. Like, this is just too hard, right? And praise the Lord, I had a friend that I shared this with, and my friend looked at me, smiled, laughed in my face, and then said, well, welcome to the Christian journey, right? Didn't he say, take up your cross and follow me? And I'm looking at my friend, I'm thinking to myself, thanks, right? You know, way to, way to be, way to be the, the encouragement that I was hoping for. Um, but he was right. You know, that the fact is, is that Christ didn't say, you know, I'm going to baptize you and in baptizing you and in claiming you as my beloved and the father's beloved son, that life is going to be roses. He said, no, if, if they have persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If, if they've rejected me, they'll reject you, right? I'm asking you to take up your cross and follow me. I'm not saying, I'm not asking you to do it perfectly. I'm asking you just to take it up and follow me. And, and, and I wanted to quit after that, that first time of desolation. And then the second time of desolation. And then the third time of desolation, you're like, oh, maybe there's actually something here that's, that's, that's this is actually part of life. This isn't something that, that I'm doing wrong as much as, as if I'm living the spiritual life well, desolation is going to be a part of it. I remember somebody said, Father, I've never experienced a single day of desolation in my life. And I said, I don't know what kind of relationship you have with Jesus. Because I don't know a single saint that hasn't experienced desolation. And it may be that we've chosen not to acknowledge it or we, we've chosen to, to distract ourselves in it so we, we haven't noticed it. But, but desolation is, is, a, is an ordinary part of the spiritual life. It doesn't mean that we accept it as, as being, um, that, that doesn't, sorry, let me say it this way, but that doesn't mean that we simply let it be there. Right? Ignatius says, no, no, like when it comes, we need to push against it. But that doesn't mean that it isn't an, an ordinary part of the spiritual journey. You know, uh, um, Father, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, Father Gallagher gives a great example. He says that in the spiritual journey, right, the marathon runner is a great example for us. Because after having run many miles, when fatigue has begun to set in, they don't cease running until the race is completed. In desolation, you and I are being invited by the Lord to acknowledge, yeah, we've come many miles and we're tired and we don't yet see the end of the race, but we know it's there. And so we keep running, we keep going. And maybe we get a cramp, maybe we pull something, and so we have to hobble along. But we keep taking one step after another. Great effort is required of us. Great effort. You know, and the other example that Father Gallagher uses uh, is that, you know, is that of, of a college student who, who, for whatever unfortunate reason, has his five exams the last three days of finals. And he spends every hour preparing for those exams, knowing that at some point they will all be finished and there will be a great freedom that follows that. And, and this is what allows him to continue to, to walk and to take the time and to invest in his studies is that he knows on the other side of the exams, there is a great freedom. And so that's where the patience comes from. And we're just reminded that, that that because the Lord has promised us that we're going to be consoled, we can have the patience. The Lord has promised that he won't leave us here. We can have the patience to be able to continue to walk, to be gentle with ourselves, to be gentle with others, to be gentle with the circumstances we're in, because the Lord has given us this grace. And so we rejoice in that. And, and, and it's kind of exciting in a way because you're like, yeah, I am my harshest critic. Jesus is never this harsh with me. And so we, we have this freedom that comes from acknowledging that I'm going to be consoled, that there is going to be consolation. And it's coming much sooner than I could ever imagine. 
because the desolation tells me it's not coming at all. And, and that allows me to take the next step and the next step. So um, this, this eighth rule really is, is just a very, very simple rule that allows us to, to go deeper into and draw on, on the gifts that God has already given to us. That, that, that considering that the Lord has permitted this and my own, and he has given me the graces necessary to stand against the desolation. And to know that the consolation will return so that I can be patient with the circumstances I find myself in. Turning back to the sixth rule, to continue to pray, to share with the Lord what what's I'm experiencing, to continue to meditate on how the Lord has been faithful using the scriptures as that rock, employing much examination, right? Instead of thinking about where I am, thinking about the thinking about where I am so that I can be attentive to it. Um, and, uh, and, and then the last part of that, right, is just that, that truth that, that we have suitable just suitable penitential gestures of enduring the time a little bit longer of spending that time in prayer of renewing our commitments to those spiritual activities. Uh, somebody was just mentioning, can we again, explain spiritual desolation versus virtues nap just versus desolation, right? So spiritual desolation are those things that relate to the Lord and to our life of prayer and relationship with him. So what would that be like God feels distant and far away that there is a heaviness around the spiritual practices and spiritual activities that I, I feel in myself uh, that the Lord was never there. that The Lord, the Lord has totally abandoned me, has forgotten me that the Lord, uh, there's a, uh, almost a sense of dejection in my own heart that I'm, uh, that, that I'll never return again to this place of intimacy with God that I, you know, and, and then, and from some, from some of that too, right. In the, in the works that there is that there in this work, like the Lord is not present here. The Lord, the Lord used to be present in this place for me, but the Lord is no longer here. The Lord is no longer present. Um, there's almost a sense of resignation. When I go to pray, there's a sense of, of de dejection or despondency. And I come to pray. There's no desire for the spiritual life. There's no desire for those things. The reading of scripture, uh, the talking of spiritual things themselves becomes burdensome. Versus just desolation around, around the stress of work, around relationships with other people, around the fact that I, I, I might struggle in a sense psychologically, either with a sense of not belonging or a sense of loneliness or a sense of sadness. And those natural desolations can become spiritual and can move into the spiritual life. But they're not precisely spiritual uh, desolations, um, because one of the things too that we we are very graced with, just to recall, right, is that when we're experiencing desolation, like psychological or emotional desolation, what what we are often encouraged and witnessed to by the saints is the importance of of leaning into our spiritual lives to allow that consolation that God often gives in the spiritual life to show us and to stand uh, in opposition addition to um, the psychological or emotional desolation that we experience, right? I, I'll have a, I have a friend who struggled with depression for a long time, and he'll say that, that he, he struggles with natural depression, but in his, his spiritual life, it's incredibly consoling and incredibly rich, and he feels so close to the Lord that when he experiences the psychological desolation, right, he turns to the Lord in prayer and, and asks the Lord to help him again uh, to stand in the truth at the depths of his being that he is in relationship, that he is in communion with others. So again, that's just the difference between desolation uh, and spiritual desolation, right? Spiritual desolation deals with the spiritual life. Those things that, that you know, when the fire, the fire runs cold in terms of the life of prayer, of scripture, uh, of acts of service and charity for the love of God, right? Those would be the places that we could see that there would be spiritual desolation. So again, in short, the eighth rule is about patience. It requires of us work to be patient and to consider again that consolation will return and we will soon be consoled, which allows us to say, okay, I can take one more step. I can take one more step. I can take one more step and not lose uh, 
the confidence that the Lord has given me the natural powers supported by his grace to continue to walk, uh, to continue to run the race. Um, Father Burke, if there's anything that you would, any, any, any images, any experiences uh, just from being in your own life from the vocation director standpoint that you'd wanna share about this rule? Yeah, Father C, thank you. Um, yeah, it's kind of nice uh, having been in the vocation office 12 years and then Father Steve now and it uh, around two years, we have had a lot of experience working with uh, young men, uh, especially in, in this path, also young women discerning their vocation. And this one is so important because what St. Ignatius is saying is, as Father Steve said, don't give up uh, with the little desolation. Our, I think our culture more and more goes toward quick fixes. And if things aren't going well, then we wanna, we wanna change directions. And it's almost like in a video game, if it's not going well, we wanna hit restart and you know, try, it, try it again without like going through those, that time of desolation, that difficult time waiting in patience for something to get better, especially around the area of our vocation. So um, whether it's marriage, priesthood, religious life, single life, there's gonna be challenging times. As he said, uh, Jesus didn't say, follow me and your life's gonna be, uh, a, it's gonna be a bed of roses, a bowl of cherries, whatever <laughs> image you wanna use, you'll never have any problems. In fact, he said the opposite. You know, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Um, I think so. I'd ask you if you have any ideas in scripture about scriptural characters where this rule might fit in. The first one that comes to mind for me is, uh, you know, think about Jesus in the um, in the garden. You know, I guess it's okay to say Jesus experienced spiritual desolation. Is that okay? Um, you know. Did he, you know, he, even though he didn't despair, but uh, sweating blood, knowing like, wow, Lord, if Father, if if this, if it can let this cup pass from me, uh, but not my will, but yours be done. You can see his, his staying on course and all the way to Calvary, keeping his eyes on the Lord, as difficult as that was. I'm sure there was tons of natural and spiritual desolation, the, the suffering. Um, but the Lord, you know, Jesus saying, I, I am with you. Um, someone said, uh, Psalm 30, when I recognize I'm going through desolation, I remember, quote, at nightfall, weeping enters in, but the dawn, but with the dawn rejoicing, Psalm 30, verse six. So that sense of, uh, when you're in the middle of the night and you can't sleep, uh, it seems like it's going to be an eternity, doesn't it? Or when we're suffering in our vocation, like I can't endure anymore. I can't take it anymore, as Father Steve said. And the Lord's saying, I will give you the grace. Trust in me. Uh, I will be with you. Working with married couples, you know, you're going through a difficult time. Um, now, there's all kinds of circumstances uh, involved in in married vocations where things get difficult. Um, but if it's a, you know, there's no physical abuse or anything, but there's just a, this desolation, you're trying to pray, nothing seems to be happening. You're wondering, gosh, maybe, maybe I made a, a wrong choice here. Um, and the Lord wants to, you know, walk with you through that, through that darkness. Happened many times walking with young men in their vocation to the priesthood, where um, it could be spiritual or natural desolation. Maybe, maybe they're having a difficult time in a class. Maybe they're praying and just it's just dry. Doesn't seem like anything's happening. So this must mean that God's calling me out of the seminary. Not necessarily. Um, if there's no clear signs, no no clear sense of you know, God calling you in another direction, 
It's just, he might just be purifying you, saying, stay with me, be patient. I'll give you, I'll give you the grace to keep on going. I'm trying to think of my own vocation. Um, yeah, there's one time that comes to mind where I think I've, I've shared, I don't go into details around it, but um, I was it, the vocation director and there was a bunch of stuff going on. And I would, I remember going to Archbishop Sarton at the time and I said, I, you need to get a new vocation director. This isn't for me, I want out. Um, and there, I, as I'm saying that, I think that's exactly what the evil one was wanting to, wanted me to do. And uh, Bishop Sarton and his wisdom, he's like, stop it. You know, let's continue to pray about this. And let's see over time, let's see what the Lord is speaking to us. And sure enough, I, w I remember going into the, we we're fortunate to have a chapel in the house. And I'd come home at night and I would just drop to my knees and say, Lord, I, I've got nothing. i got nothing left. <laughs> um, you know, show me the path. All I could sense was it just seemed dark, that, that spiritual desolation. And little by little, you know, the Lord uh, brought me through that difficult time. And thanks be to God, there were another, spent another eight years as vocation director after that time. So if you're in that time of, of desolation, uh, you know, whether it's in your vocation, maybe in marriage, maybe discerning your vocation, or, or maybe it's, it could be in a job too, you know, it could be in your career, it could be any kind of big decision um, where you just want to stop, jump ship and go another direction. I always say never make a big decision when you're in desolation because uh, it may not be it, it may not be the Lord speaking you know it's it's important to you know talk this through with a spiritual director a spiritual companion that can guide you along that path this uh, I was just talking to a, a priest friend today who has a friend going through a difficult time in his vocation and uh, you know, you can see where it, it just made me think of um, uh, Bishop Kaffer, God rest his soul. When when a priest left the active ministry, Bishop Kaffer's first question was, when did you stop praying? And almost always the, the priest would admit, yeah, I, I stopped praying a year or two ago or um you know, the bravery that we pray, we promise to pray. I, I stopped that a long time ago. So we we turn, this is a place where we're, we're not sticking with those spiritual practices that we had, prayer and meditation and examination, and we start going to self-reliance. And it's that's a dangerous place to move because um, it, it usually is going to end up with you moving away from something that maybe God had called you to. So this priest friend today was telling me that his friend seems to be moving away from his vocational call. And um, my question would be, are you praying? Are you sticking with those spiritual practices that uh, brought you into this vocation so that you, you don't uh, make a decision that you might regret someday? And the evil one is very, very with this. Um, uh, Tom says, I think of St. Joseph leading the Holy Family with such great patience in many episodes of, of desolation. Thank you. Like, uh, you know, the, the Holy Innocents where, you know, they were killing all of the, the babies two years and under and St. Joseph was patiently taking his whole family and, 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 and moving. His vocation was to love and protect Mary and, and Jesus did all, all he could. Um, it seems is a question. It seems like God will send the grace of strength 
more than patience. Is this wrong? Let me read that again. It seems like God will send the grace of strength more than patience. I don't know if it's an either or type of thing. I think I think God's grace um, will do both. You know, it, God will give you what you need. And so sometimes we need strength to get through those difficult times. Sometimes we need patience. Sometimes we need both. Um, and Father Steve, if you had have a different response to that did you hear that i would i would say that you would need we need both and the strength is often the that gift of perseverance it's that faithful patient perseverance uh the gift of fortitude and so i think that that goes hand in hand but we have to choose whether or not we're going to cooperate with that gift right whether we're going to cooperate with the hope that arises in, the, in this eighth rule, recognizing that consolation is again coming, recognizing that again we will soon be consoled, and that's what allows us to have the perseverance and the patience. Uh, but that that perseverance really is is strength. That's that's fortitude. That's the virtue of fortitude or courage uh, that God gives to us there. And so it's it's just important, uh, I think, to to, to recognize that they go they go together they're not separated it's just the way that the strength is being made manifest is through the patient perseverance uh in our lives which we again have to say accept and uh and respond and respond to that grace thank you uh twyla says the quarantine is a great example i would i would agree with that this this quarantine, I've had so many people say, um, you know, thank you to Father, you and Father Steve for providing these things during the quarantine, um, because without continuing on in prayer, uh, I might have, you know, gone into some, you know, deep, dark hole. And so that's a great example, Twyla, where um, we're in difficult times to stick with these spiritual practices, even if you feel dry as a bone uh, like mother Teresa said you know if you've read her diary some 40 years of spiritual dryness spiritual desolation and she just kept on going she knew that if she just kept showing up at adoration kept on this she said I never got any sign that God was calling me uh, in any different direction so I kept moving forward in prayer um, I think that's a, a powerful example of this rule. Um, one more comment here. I've had desolation and consolation that I would like to share. It's a, it's a long one, so. On Facebook, you can read that. Just one more. When I wake in each morning, one of the things I say to the Lord before I get out of bed is, Lord, I will need your help today. Amen. It just reminds me that of what Dr. Bob Schutz teaches so much in his book, Be Healed. Um, like the one of the key differences in the spiritual life is, am I going to depend on God? Or am I going to depend on myself? Uh, total dependence on God, total self-reliance, ungodly self-reliance. Um, as I look back on my life, there's so many times where I want to take over the reins. I want to take back control and take it away from God. And underneath that is, for me, was a lack of trust in God. Um, and it's only happened by just experience of, of looking back on my life and seeing that God was so um, faithful and trustworthy that he's teaching me how to trust him. He's teaching me how to, in the most difficult times, 
come to him and uh, he will give me what I need. Let's say when going through chemo a few years ago, I would sometimes say to the God, to God, Lord, I have nothing for you. And he understood. He let me just rest in his love. He wants us to speak from our hearts. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, Lisa, for sharing. Um, so anybody have any questions about that uh, before we go into prayer? that rule makes sense if you've been tempted to just quit and on this path following God um, to throw in the towel I liked I read, wrote down Father Steve's quotes is uh, um, it's never going to end or why keep trying just I've, I've had enough <laughs> um, and think about several scriptural characters who who have been there uh job is one of them right job's friends you know curse god why would you follow that god if that's going to happen rick your your mic's on did you want to share something i just i wanted to share what i read tonight right before prayer and uh, you know i've never um i've never prayed for prudence because I never really understood prudence. And uh, I'm reading, going through the consecration for St. Joseph a, a second time. And I just wanted to read what it says about prudence. And maybe in these times where we have desolation, you know, praying for prudence may be something to consider as, as this says. It says, St. Joseph will help you exercise supernatural prudence. In every situation, he will teach you to allow prudence to be your charioteer, guiding you to always do what is right for the sake of love of God and neighbor, no matter how much you have to suffer for it. And I just thought, as I was reading that tonight, even before this, this session, I just thought I, I find myself so many times in that situation and don't necessarily know what to pray for, but guiding you to always do what is right for the sake of love of God really, really hit me. Hmm. Isn't that amazing how the Lord <laughs> pray something or pray with something and then boom, it comes uh, right back to you. Thank you for sharing. So I'm feeling called to pray with uh, uh, Mark chapter four. You don't have to look this up if you don't want, so, uh, but you're gonna recognize the, the story. It's the storm of the sea, storm on the sea. And maybe you're feeling like you're in that storm right now. Um, and let's see what the Lord has to, to say to us tonight. So let's just place ourselves in God's presence. As you breathe in, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. And as you exhale, letting go of your worries, your anxieties, fears, tension. Take a moment just to to do that breathing. So again, I'm going to read this twice as I always do, and I put yourself in the scene. Just use your imagination or pay attention to what gets stirred up inside of your hearts. Then I'll guide us through the meditation. That day as evening drew on, Jesus said to them, 
let us cross over to the farther shore. Leaving the crowd, they took him away in the boat in which he was sitting, while the other boats accompanied him. It happened that a bad squall blew up. The waves were breaking over the boat, and it began to ship water badly. Jesus was in the stern through it all, sound asleep on a cushion. They finally woke him and said to him, Teacher, does it not matter to you that we're going to drown? He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Quiet, be still. The wind fell off and everything grew calm. Then he said to them, why are you so terrified? Why are you lacking in faith? A great awe overcame them at this. They kept saying to one another, who can this be that the wind and the sea obey him? Take a moment as we hear the story the first time and Pay attention to our hearts. That day as evening drew on, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the farther shore. Leaving the crowd, they took him away in the boat in which he was sitting while the other boats accompanied him. It happened that a bad squall blew up. The waves were breaking over the boat and it began to ship water badly. Jesus was in the stern through it all, sound asleep on a cushion. They finally woke him and said to him, teacher, does it not matter to you that we're going to drown? He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, quiet, be still. The wind fell off and everything grew calm. Then he said to them, why are you so terrified? Why are you lacking in faith? A great awe overcame them at this. They kept saying to one another, who can this be? that the wind and the sea obey him. Let's take a moment to acknowledge what's being stirred up, thoughts, feelings, desires, or an image. Pay attention to how the Lord is gazing upon you in that. And now relate to the Lord what's being stirred up in your heart. Again, no filter. Don't think, oh, that's not a proper thing to feel or say. Just relate to the Lord, like your best friend, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, all three. This is what I'm experiencing, Lord.
Now, how does God respond to what you just shared with him? What does God want you to know? How does he gaze upon you? So just take a moment to receive from the Holy Trinity. a minute or two just to respond to the Lord. Time to finish your dialogue, whatever you want to share, whatever's being stirred up in response to what God has spoken to you. Include our prayer with recognizing the three persons of the Holy Trinity. All glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, as we do each time, if you'd like to share. Maybe experience in prayer there. Just a, a little teaching there about when we finish the prayer with uh, the glory be. It's intentional to just to continue to help us recognize that prayer is relational, that God is personal, and uh, you know depending on if you relate, just and we know one God, three persons, which we just celebrated um, yesterday. And we're re relating to a God who knows us, loves us, wants to have a relationship with us. Sandy had said earlier, when I look back, I, I see when I wasn't close to God, he was always the closest to me and brought me through reviewing of her life. Trust in God more no matter what the situation is.
was brought to the uh, the painting of, I believe it's Rembrandt's painting of the boat in the storm, and very powerful. You can imagine, I might have talked about this here, the, the boat is um, on an angle, and a big wave is coming over the upper side of the boat. You can see about half of the apostles there, there's fear, they're trying to fight the waves themselves, like kind of this image of self-reliance. And on the lower part of the boat down here is Jesus kind of reclining. The other half of the apostles around him, just in total peace. Like saying, even though the storms are all around, uh, they were at peace with the Lord. And so the, the phrase on there that just stuck with me was, Jesus was there. It was like the Lord trying to say to me, uh, I've been with you the whole time. When you try to take the reins and do it yourself, uh, you're forgetting that I'm here to, to help you. Humbly, the Lord's words are directed right at me. Somebody else knows that painting. Rick, the Lord desires me to be present with him, to understand that things that are happening are part of his plan. He helps me look back and realize he's been there for me, but he wants me to realize he's there with me in the present. This will help me differentiate false comfort of food, drink, etc., and look for the true comfort in the Lord. Thank you. He showed me as a special place prepared for me. I just need to be patient. And I told him, thank you for waiting for me to fall in love with me. Thank you, Patty. Riddell, if, if we are Jesus' disciples, we should be prepared for him to take us to the farthest shore, knowing he will command the wind and the waves to be still if we trust he is in our boat. Amen. More. With a smile and open arms, Jesus said, I am here with you to help you carry your cross. Your trust and love in me is strong. Through the chaos, I have to ask for help. Uh, so again, pay attention to self-reliance and reliance on God, dependence on God, uh, fundamental movement in our spiritual lives. At uh, least I thought of Father Peter Jaros, who sometimes seemed unbelievably carefree he must have had very deep faith and rest in Jesus. You know, Father, Father Peter, that's, that's him. Mary, when we, when we recently had the tornado, two trees came down and the chimney was hit and nothing hit the house and the chimney was cocked. I am always with you. Uh, amen. Sandy, I thank God for unanswered prayers. He said, I will never abandon you or forsake you. I love that. I thank God all the time for not answering the prayers I asked many times. Oh my gosh, he saved me. I never noticed Jesus was with them in the midst of the storm. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, a, there's another storm where Jesus comes walking on the water where he's outside the boat. Uh, but this is a story where he's he's in the boat with them. And I think kind of that image of He's with us right there. God will calm our inner, tor inner turmoil if we just ask. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, your sharing adds to all of our, uh, our faith. Even though you feel surrounded in abandonment, I am always with you and will never abandon you. Mm. Yeah, so we talk a lot of, during the daytime prayers of wounds and lies and vows, um, you know, so Father Steve kind of talked about the lies that this will never end or why keep trying, just give up, you know, you're, you're chasing, you're going down the wrong path. Um, and the truth is I, I have never abandoned you, I never will. One more and then I'll turn it over to Father Steve. Dan shared, I'm not alone in the boat in the storm. It's not all about me. The others are going through the same thing. Hmm. 
I praise Jesus for his power to calm the storm. That's a great uh, insight, Daniel, that it wasn't just one person and Jesus, right? There was a bunch of them. And as we talk about this quarantine, we're all going through the same thing. And uh, Lord's helping us to it. Just like what we're doing here, this community that the Lord is building up, uh, caring for us. Brother Steve, any thoughts to... I, I just think that the simplest thing to remember, right, is that that it's a journey, like we're on an adventure. And I think the storm reminds us that we're on an adventure. And I think that uh, just the beautiful, the beauty of what everyone has shared uh, reminds us of that, that this is, it's one step at a time. And that we don't have to have everything together. In fact, we can't. And that just little by little we go. And so let's just... Uh, Close with prayer, just in that awareness that we're on this journey together with the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we, we thank you for the gift uh, of this time tonight, the gift of patience, the opportunity to pray and to rest in you. We ask that you send the Spirit upon us to help us persevere in those difficult times, those challenging times, those times of spiritual desolation, and to truly rejoice and to to. Uh, to give thanks for those moments of spiritual consolation. We entrust you all that you have brought to light, and we ask, Father, in a particular way to draw ever closer to your Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.